10 on my end. <laughs> so I don't want to take up any of our time. I am going to turn it right over to our panelists to kick us off. Um, and I'll be monitoring the chat. I can flag us at a five minute warning if we need it. But other than that, it's all yours. Perfect. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. I am Michelle Reed. I'm the Director of Open Educational Resources at the University of Texas at Arlington. And I am joined today by two of my colleagues, Dr. Bonnie Boardman, who is Assistant Professor in our College of Engineering, and Julian Rodriguez, who is in the Department of Communication. And they have extremely exciting OER projects. I'm going to spend the first couple of minutes um, the time just came up. Uh, I'm going to spend the first couple of minutes of the presentation uh, establishing the context, um, but most of the time we'll be hearing from them about uh, the work that they've done on their OER and the kind of impact that it has had um, on their students, on colleagues, um, as well as on the profession a little more broadly. Um, let's see. There we go. So, so a few details about UTA. We are uh, located in, in North Texas. Uh, we are an R1 institution, so uh, very high research activity as categorized by the Carnegie classification um, here in the US. Uh, we're also um, very frequently noted as an affordable institution um, and a, a good institution for, as you can see on this slide, uh, frequently voted best for vets, um, a high, uh, we're a Hispanic serving institution, uh, voted one of the best schools for Latinos, um, and, and very frequently at the top um, of uh, rankings for diversity. And so I want to take a quick look at uh, I did not know this was animated. Um, some fast facts about UTA students. So these numbers are posted to our website and they come from 2018. Uh, about 32% of our undergraduate students are Hispanic, 15% African American, and 12% Asian, with nearly 5% international students. Um, I will focus on undergrad because that's the two uh, projects that we'll be talking about today. Um, so I want to share a little about how we as a library support open education on our campus. So we do have, um, we've had a program for four years now, almost four years. Um, and we provide support for adoption, modification, and creation of OER. Uh, we have a department now. We have grown uh, considerably over the last year. We went from two FTE a year ago um, to four now, uh, from three employees to six employees in the department. And these are the kinds of activities that we provide support for. A lot of them, however, are supported by staff outside of the OER department. So we get assistance from staff in our access and discovery group, uh, in our scholarly communication division. Um, we have publishing specialists that help us out with accessibility. So even though we have an OER department, responsibility for OER is really distributed across the libraries. Um, so we can help people discover OER and um, find what's out there available to them. We provide support for customizing OER. So if something um, kind of meets their needs, but not entirely, we will help them move content from wherever it exists into Pressbooks, which is what we use for our publishing platform, um, and then help them understand how to approach licensing so we're abiding by legal and ethical standards. Uh, and then we'll help with um, dissemination and archiving. So we use Pressbooks for the live version, but we also archive all of our OER in our institutional repository. Um, and I will share a link when I can see my chat again. I can't see chat, by the way. Um, I'll share a link to our slides, which are posted in the institutional uh, repository, uh, along with a number of other presentations and administrative content, as well as the, the archive and final reports from our OER work. Um, so we do metadata archiving. Uh, we help people rethink course assignments. So thinking about how they can involve students in the creation process. Um, and then make connections as well. So uh, Bonnie and Julian's presence uh, at this conference is supported by a, a relatively new open education travel scholarship program that we're providing uh, in the libraries. Uh, 
it immediately was impacted by COVID. So we, we haven't actually sent anyone to a conference of, a, you know, to uh, attend a conference in person yet, um, but we're hoping to, when everything is safe to travel again, to um, open that up. Um, so we are helping people connect with the broader open education community. And then the main thing I wanted to, to chat about is the financial and technical support that we provide. So we have, um, we provide a lot of technical assistance with Pressbooks, our publishing platform. Um, and we have an email list that we monitor where people can contact us very easily and get a, a quick uh, response to their questions. But mostly we're teaching people how to use the platform themselves and trying to um, help people understand open licensing and what that means for their work and how to engage with other people's work. So what you're seeing here is um, a, a bit of information about our grant program. Uh, we have three different types of awards currently. Uh, Bonnie is going to be talking about an adoption stipend. And so she was able to find an, an existing OER that she wanted to customize. And our team pulled that content into Pressbooks for her so she could Im immediately start revising and remixing that content. And we have scale grants which are intended for all sections of a course. So if an entire department wants to move to OER instead of a, an individual faculty member, um, those scale grants can help to support that. And then we have innovation grants if there is a gap in content um, and we need to uh, help to fill it, we provide a, a lot more um, funding because uh, there's a lot more labor involved in those types of projects. Um, for the first few years of our program, we had about $20,000 to support it. In this last year, the university's administration invested significantly in OER. So you see a link there to a press release about the investment. Um, we got a half million dollars to support OER last year, and the, the intention is for that to continue uh, over time. So um, let me see. Uh, we have been these are so in such a strange order. Um, we have been doing the grant program, even though we have a lot more funding now, we've been doing the grant program for a few years and have been collecting student feedback over time. And it has been overwhelmingly positive, um, but it falls into these, these primary categories. So we see a lot of appreciation from students for uh, different format options. They can engage with the text online through Pressbooks. They can download a PDF. They can purchase an optional print copy from the bookstore. So they really like having that agency and deciding what format is going to meet their needs best. Um, we also see a lot of appreciation for customization. So, uh, and students are making a connection between the customized materials and their success in the course. So they, they feel that they're able to prepare for class um, more efficiently when uh, content is customized for the course. Um, lots, of course, of appreciation for cost savings. So they really like um, that it's saving them money, but beyond that, they're making a connection between the cost savings and equity equal opportunity um, for access to education. And then, of course, we have a lot of encouragement um, for growing the program. They want to see OER used in every course, in every discipline across campus. And we are certainly working towards that goal. Um, one, more, one more slide, and I'll turn this over to Bonnie. Um, so we do as part of, we get a lot of open-ended, uh, have a lot of open-ended questions, uh, but we also collect some quantitative uh, data as well. So um, in the last three years of the program, about 94% of our students say the quality of the resources that they use are as good or better than traditional course materials and 96% say the same for ease of access. Um, so, and the link on this page will take you to our Pressbooks catalog home if you wanna check out some of the resources that these students are talking about. Um, but I will now turn this over to Bonnie uh, to have her tell us a little about her OER project. Unmute would be good. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Bonnie Boardman. I'm a faculty member in the Industrial Engineering Department at the University of Texas at Arlington. I'm also the um, Undergraduate Program Director. So I want to um, kind of frame my presentation today um, in, in literature and in movies. They, when they 
talk about a character's, how they got to be who they are, they call it a backstory. Um, but for some reason in comic books, they, they call it an origin story. Um, so I want to present my origin story and um, how I uh, very quickly um, have turned from not knowing what OER was into a real supporter of it. <clears throat> okay, Michelle, you forgot. <laughs> You're in charge. Um, I'm so I call, head, just listen. <laughs> so um, this is my, I, I'm calling my, my uh, superhero captain coercer, um, an origin story of um, probably this is how everybody in my department feels about me at this point. Uh, so this is just a timeline. I know some of that text is kind of small um, and I'll talk about it as I go through the presentation. Um, but mostly what I want to show with this is that this is um, was a really quick um, turn for me, um, you know, really pre-2017 um, or really in 2017, I had never heard of OER before. I was one of those faculty members that, that had never heard of it, didn't know what it was. Um, it didn't exist on my radar. Um, so from, from that short amount of time until now, I have learned so much and I have, you know, again, really become somebody in my department who is a huge advocate. And I wanna talk about today, how in that very short time that happened. So I'll call, um, Pre-2017 through 2017, my uninformed years, <laughs> for lack of a, a, you know, it could be a worse term than that, but we'll be nice um, and call it that. Um, so I'm going to, the, the uh, text that I developed or um, is, was for an, an introduction to industrial engineering course. I've taught this course for a really long time. And I've actually never used a textbook in this course. Um, I mostly because I just couldn't find one that fit what I needed. This is a, a course that students take in their very first semester um, in the discipline. And so my goals for the course, my learning objectives for the course are for the students to learn about the discipline, um, learn about it as a career and also as um, what they're going to be studying to get them some computer skills that they're gonna need throughout their time. Um, and so there really wasn't a text that fit that. So I had um, just kind of used various stuff that I had found here and there and put together. Um, I would, and I would assign that reading from these various sources um, and I would assess, did they do the reading by just giving them exam questions over the reading? We really didn't talk very much about the reading in class. It was kind of just a homework that they did outside of class. And then before the test, when we were reviewing for the test, I would say, hey, don't forget, you know, your reading will be covered. And that was about it. Um, I would say both from my perspective, as well as from my students' perspective, it was the least successful part of the class. Um, it just, you know, it didn't seem important to me, I think, and therefore it didn't seem important to them. Um, and, you know, what they got out of it is, is probably not a lot. Um, so how I got from that um, is several things happened kind of all at the same time. Uh, the first thing that happened is, you know, one of those great things that happens at conferences, um, and I hope it's happening for you all at this conference. Um, I've been to several sessions and I've taken lots of notes of things that I've learned. Um, so I was at a conference one year, it was an industrial engineering conference. And I, it wasn't even part of the presentation. I was, you know, it was one of those networking things. And I overheard, and these poor people weren't even talking to me. I just overheard um, them talk about um, a faculty member named Jane Fraser who had put up her intro material online for people to use. 
And when I heard that, I was like, oh, what? Um, so I introduced myself and asked for some information about that. And, and they gave me um, a web address where I could go and see her information. And when I got back, I, I did. And sure enough, she had put up a ton of stuff that she had used in a class that was similar to mine. Um, it was in a PDF format, just online. And it was really just a wall of text. It was a lot of good text, um, but it was just a wall of text. It wasn't real pretty to look at or really exciting, but it was exciting for me because it had just a lot of the things that I needed for my class, um, way more information than I needed for my class. Um, so I started using that. I used that for a, a few semesters, but it was kind of the same problem that I had with my previous readings in that it just wasn't real exciting or engaging to the students. And I was still assessing it with exam questions. So, you know, in week eight, I would give an exam and it would cover, among other things, the readings they had done for the first eight weeks. Uh, so then I started using a commercial product because I wanted to add in some interactive content. And um, I found a commercial product that I could in, bring in, import, um, the, the parts of the wall of text that were um, important to my class. And I could add in some interactive content to that that could make the reading hopefully more exciting for the students um, and also could do some more timely assessment. So weekly, they would have some interactive content embedded within their week reading that would go to a grade, kind of a participation grade. Um, all of that, that was a big improvement, both from my perspective as well as for the students' perspective on the reading part of the class. Um, but I still had some doubts about this solution. Um, and, and one was um, the cost to the students, because this was a commercial product that did cost the students something to, to access. Um, and with all of those commercial products, there's some privacy concerns. Um, I didn't have any students express those to me, but I had those concerns about what was happening. And then it was mostly, um, other than the cost, the big thing was it was just yet another login for the students to have that, that you know, a lot of them didn't manage to do until the third or fourth week of class. Um, and then they had to remember to do it and they had to do it. And then I had to go to this other system if I wanted to make any changes and to get the grades for the participation. So while it was an improvement, it wasn't perfect and I still had problems. Um, so then I will call the next phase of um, Captain Coercer's metamorphosis, the kind of 2018 to 2019. Uh, where I discovered the secret hideout of all superheroes, which is known as the Campus Library, um, and where I learned so much. Um, so I was uh, walking across campus, and you guys all know how there's those walls that have a zillion flyers on them. And um, a flyer caught my eye that said it was an introduction to press books, which I had never heard about. But for some reason, I went over and I uh, looked at the flyer and the things that it said, you know, sounded interesting to me and they sounded like maybe they could address some of the doubts that I was having about uh, the commercial system that I was using. Um, so I went to this workshop at the library and there I learned so much in like an hour <laughs> over lunch. And I think they even fed me, if I remember correctly. So um, <laughs> I learned about um, press books, which is what was advertised. And I found that um, I could do, and, and they also talked a little bit about the H5P content. And so I thought, well, I can do exactly with this what I'm doing with the commercial system. I can bring in this text. I can make it look a little nicer. Um, than a wall of text. I can do some format, formatting. I can add some interactive content. You know, boom, right there. I can do what I need to do. Um, and it's not, my students won't have to log into anything. It will just be available to them. So it addressed all of these doubts that I was having about how I was giving my students content. Um, also at that 
that workshop, I learned about hypothesis, which I'm using now. I'll talk in just a minute about how I'm using it. And I also learned about the CARES grant that Michelle had mentioned um, where I could remix, get this grant to remix um, the material that I was using and add the content that I wanted to add. So that was really the very start of my journey was just this hour long workshop where I learned so much. So that's who the real heroes are of this story, or you guys, all of you that are here and that I know work tirelessly on the behalf of um, you know, OER and um, advocate for that. And I just wanna say thank you from somebody who didn't know and, and, and still has a lot to learn, but I want you to know that it's appreciated from the faculty. Um, I got so much support from UTA's OER team. Um, Michelle talked a little bit about some of the things that they do and they did all of that for me. Um, they helped me to import the material and to break it up into chunks that made sense instead of again, a big wall of text. Uh, they created the book cover for me. They helped me with, an, with accessibility checks, which again was a whole new world to me. I didn't really know anything about that. So they taught me about it and they did checks for me and they found places for me to improve um, and they helped me to do that. And probably most importantly, they were just a constant source of answers and when I had questions, but probably more importantly, of reassurance to me um, that, that I could do this and that I was doing the right thing and helping me with my students. Um, I just really appreciate everything that I, that I got and continue to get. Um, so now here we are 2020 and beyond. So this is where my um, Captain Coercer uh, character is born. And I wanna talk a little bit about my, my plans going forward. Um, so my uh, OER was published this past summer. Um, it's been using, so I started in, in 2019, um, got it all into press books with the material. Um, I, you know, beta tested it for a couple of semesters and before it was officially published. Um, other than the, the interactive content, I'm also using Hypothesis. So now the readings that the students get weekly, they make annotations in Hypothesis um, within Canvas, which is the learning management system that we use. Um, that has gone there's been a few little glitches and problems, but as far as the students doing it and the annotation process has been fantastic. Um, I ask the students just as they're reading a, a, a chapter to annotate a sentence or a section that spoke to them for whatever reason that they've seen examples of this in their life or at a job that they've had um, and to tell us a little more. And I've learned so much about my students um, and they've learned a lot about themselves and each other. It's really not only been a reading assignment, it's really been um, community building for these students who are in their first semester of a degree program. So I've really, that's been very successful. Um, I so appreciated what I've learned and, and my students have liked this that I went to my department head and I said, look, we really need to be doing more of this um, as a department and uh, told him a little bit about it. And he was on board and agreed. And we then went to um, our faculty in the department and coerced them a little bit <laughs> and um, educated them a little bit about what we could do. And now, um, our department becoming a Z degree where we are, there are no textbook costs um, for the students is a strategic goal that we have. Um, so it is listed as a strategic goal for, goal for our department. Um, obviously we don't control all of the text of the classes. They, our students have classes outside of our department, but we're starting with our departmental classes and we're starting with the freshman and sophomore classes. So the, the first, couple of years that the students have in our classes is, is where we're beginning. Um, you know, it's not an easy sell for everybody, for all faculty, um, but they 
they definitely all see the advantage and um, the, the reasons to do this. So we're just working slowly and you know trying to make little progress and steps and that's okay. Um, industrial engineering is about process engineering. We're about continuous improvement of processes. And we know it's not an all or nothing. It's not you're there or you're not there. It's just about taking little steps and, and continuously improving and get a little better. So we're good at that as industrial engineers. And that's what we're working on now. So I want to say again, thank you to all of you for all of the work that you do. Um, it has made a, a, a big difference in my career, in my what's important to me as a faculty member, again, in a very short time. Um, so I kind of just want to, again, say thank you and let you know that what you're doing matters and you're reaching people and affecting people that maybe you don't even know that you're reaching and affecting. So please keep putting up those flyers and please keep offering those workshops um, because I promise it has made a difference. So thank you very much. Oh, those were just some credits, yeah. Excellent, I guess it's my turn. Let me actually try to see if I can request to control your screen. Um, Michelle, so I can advance those for you. Okay, I think I should be able to control it now. Um, there you go. Um, can we go back? I guess I spoke too early. Um, there you go. Okay. <clears throat> So first of all, I am Julian Rodriguez. I am a broadcast journalism specialist in the Department of Communication. And this year I was the recipient of the UTA Libraries Innovation Grant, uh, which is about $10,000. And I had big plans for 2020 and here we are, you know, just everything is in many ways uh, in a big pause. And especially with this textbook, and you'll see in a moment why this textbook is really uh, innovative and innovative. And, and what this textbook focuses on is Spanish language television news production in the United States. So I know that the title that we have here is in English, but really if you look at the cover, which is not yet available, it's actually in Spanish. So this is a textbook that was written in Spanish for uh, students pursuing careers in broadcast journalism who would like to focus either in Spanish language television news production or bilingual journalism. So is it challenging? Absolutely, yes. So why is it challenging? And I'm gonna go through several steps to explain why this is challenging. I'm gonna provide some background and some context because I know we have a global audience here and I want them to kind of understand exactly what I'm talking about here. So in order to explain this, we can begin by simply talking about American corn. So let's move to the next slide. So the slide, the slide that we have here uh, is basically American sweet corn. Everyone knows this corn simply because this is the type of corn that we consume, we buy in the supermarket and we consume it as a vegetable in the United States. But really this, you know, American sweet corn only represents about 1% of the corn that is produced in the United States. In the United States, the number one corn producer in the world. 99% of the corn that is produced in the United States, let's go to the next slide, it's going to be dent corn. So this one over here. And, you know, it's easy to identify because you have a little dent on each uh, kernel and this is 99% of what the USA actually produces in, in, uh, you know, in our agricultural fields. But when you really look at the United States, the United States produces less than 10 types of corn. And when we go to Latin America, next slide, what we see is that the Americas <clears throat> have hundreds of types of corn. So, 
you have all of these different grains, all of these different flavors growing all over uh, Latin America from North America, meaning Mexico to Central America to don't get me started with South America. You go to the Andean mountains and you find all kinds of types of corn. So only from Mexico, what we will see is, next slide, what we will see is that Mexico has about 60 varieties of corn. So you might be wondering, what in the world is this guy talking about? What I'm trying to talk about here is that this is culture. And when you actually talk about the varieties of corn that we produce in Latin America, then these are also immigrants that migrate to the United States and bring with them all of these little pieces of culture from all over the place. So it is quite an interesting um, kind of example of all of these immigrants that come into the United States, all of these cultural traits that they bring in and how that might affect how you produce and distribute Spanish language television news in the United States in an American system that is dominated by sweet corn and then corn, see? So um, when we actually look at American society, then what we see is that American society is more like this. So next slide. American society is like that, really. It's not like dent corn and sweet corn that is all yellow and uniform. It's more like we come from all over the place. And why corn? Because, hey, corn is, it, it comes from the Americas. It's basically the best gift we are given to the world. Uh, it's the number one exported product throughout the world. So uh, corn really has become part of an inspiration for me to approach this textbook and to actually see um, American immigration and American society through the lens of those little traits that come from the, all those little things that we bring from our, um, our cultural backgrounds, our Hispanic descent. So when we approach this OER, next slide, what we see is that it is extremely challenging. Um, we, can't, um, we can't just simply say, okay, we're gonna translate this to Spanish from English and everything's gonna be a-okay. It's not like that. I already gave you the explanation of the corn. So it's not really that simple. In order to, and what I've learned through the production of this OER is that you have to be quite flexible. Next slide. And flexibility is basically finding what you already have and then kind of fitting it in there because the United States of America is composed by people just like any other nation. Uh, a nation is its people. And we have so many different backgrounds that at some point you have to kind of negotiate how much you want to include of this culture into your textbook, how much you would like to uh, remove certain parts without actually hurting someone's feelings. And at some point you're gonna have to really say, okay, I have to make a decision and every given market will have to adjust to these changes. So this, this is a textbook that I began uh, developing back in 2013 or so. And when I started writing this OER, it actually began as a textbook. But when I started writing this textbook, I realized that I wasn't ready to write this textbook because there's no such thing as, um, as you know, uh, writing, writing something that is uniform throughout the USA that will address all of these little pieces of corn that come from all over uh, the Americas. So I had to abandon this project and I had to work for seven years to actually learn and research and produce content with my students and create public-private partnerships with Telemundo and Univision and NBC and produce and distribute content nationally and internationally and travel through Latin America to be able to attain kind of a sense of how I could produce this textbook. And ultimately, I couldn't produce a textbook that wasn't flexible enough because media changes so much. You know, current uh, and emerging media is constantly evolving. It's literally an algorithm away from revolutionary, you know, changing everything completely. 
that um, the open educational resource became truly a wonderful option. So for that, I would like to thank again the UTA libraries for you know, bringing this idea in, opening their doors, explaining to us how we could approach this and then making it possible through the innovation grant. So, okay, let's actually move a little bit into talking about the United States and why this is challenging. So let's move to the next slide. And what you see is that this is the United States map, of course. And what you see is basically the percentage of Latinos that live in each one of those states. So we have uh, California, we have uh, Arizona, we have New Mexico, we have Texas, we have, um, we have Florida, and all of those are very heavy on the Hispanic community. But again, the Hispanic community is not monolithic by any means whatsoever. We have a lot of uh, Latinos coming from different parts of Latin America, about 62% of Hispanics living in the United States come from or have a Hispanic descent from Mexico. So we're talking about 37 million of about 60 million immigrants um, or, or Hispanic, the Hispanic population in the USA. About 10% of them are from Puerto Rico, but, but Puerto Ricans are not necessarily located in California and Texas. They're actually located in New York or they're located in Florida. And because of that, what you produce for Texas or for California is not necessarily something that will be very effective for Florida and New York. If you find this fairly confusing and difficult, well, it took me seven years to figure this out and understand how we could approach this. So the same thing about, can said about Cubans and Salvadoran, uh, those uh, represent, they, they tend to be also located in, in Florida. So in Florida about um, we have a lot of Cubans, we have Puerto Ricans, also in New York and in Florida, we're going to find Dominicans. And then about 2 million of those uh, of the Hispanic population is of Colombian descent. And I am of Colombian descent. I'm, I, I'm actually foreign born and then I migrated to the USA. So that's the one thing I was able to have this bilingual training to be able to understand the American system and then write it in Spanish uh, with some English terms that I could apply in there. Let's go to the next slide. So this is data basically coming from um, the Pew Research Center. And what we see is that from 1970 to about 2019, which is the data that's shared at the Pew Research Center, uh, it, we went basically from 9.6 million, uh, a population of Hispanics from 9.6 million in the United States to now just over 60 million. And when you look at that through counties, so every state is divided by counties. And when we look at the counties with the highest Hispanic population, the number one will be LA, which is in California with almost 5 million. Then we have Texas with Harris County, which is basically down south and uh, by Houston. Then we have Miami-Dade County, that's in Florida. If you really look at those very first three, we literally just touch into the things I just discussed, which is California, Texas, and Florida. The next one's gonna be, we're gonna go back west again with Arizona, Maricopa County, which has been also in the news right now because of the election. And then we have Cook County and Illinois, so we have to go north. And we go back to California, Texas, California, California. And then finally, where I live, which is, I live in Dallas County in Texas. So that's about 1 million uh, Hispanics living in Dallas County. So you see the trend, you see these changes, and then you're also wondering about language adoption and language use. How many of them actually use Spanish? So let's go to the next slide. And this one's actually gonna show us and kind of break out uh, who speaks to their children in Spanish. So on the left, we see that the share of Hispanic parents who speak Spanish to their children decry, uh, declines across immigrant generations. So this is something that's important to kind of keep in mind because I'm gonna bring in something in the future uh, that kind of talks towards that change. So if we were to look at the very first one, we see that 85% of all Hispanics speak to their children in Spanish. Now, when we go to foreign born, meaning in my case, I'm foreign born and my wife is actually from Colombia, I don't have any children, but if I had a child, that means that 97% of households just like mine will speak Spanish to their children. 
So those children are gonna learn Spanish and, and be okay. But then my children, you know, will have other children that will be the second generation that you see there and only 71% will speak to them in Spanish. So we start losing the language as we progress and by the third generation, it kind of splits uh, evenly. So about 50-50, 51 to 49. So you can actually see a decline in the use of Spanish across time, which is, which is normal. This happened with Germans. This happened with all kinds of, of immigrants that came to the United States from different countries that actually don't speak English. <clears throat> so those changes are critical to understanding the market size, meaning are these Spanish language TV stations and TV channels sustainable, whether it is TV, radio, newspaper. And you need to then look at the next slide, which is looking at um, unauthorized immigrants are almost a quarter of foreign born population. So we're looking at the foreign born population here and we see that unauthorized immigrants um, and remember, don't, don't use the term illegal immigrants. It's not the proper way to refer to unauthorized immigrants. You say unauthorized immigrants. So, uh, you know, quote unquote, or, you know, parenthesis here, people are not illegal. You know, um, there's an act, there, an action needs to be illegal. So there's no such thing as illegal immigrants, there's unauthorized immigrants. So unauthorized immigrants represent about 10.5 million, 11 million of this population that we see here. Then we have uh, temporary lawful residents, which is basically kind of uh, seasonal workers. And then we have lawful permanent residents and those who have been naturalized. So I fall within the 45% who's been a naturalized citizen. When we look at this, we're looking at about 47 million or so. And what happens is that almost 40 million of Hispanics speak Spanish in the USA and they speak Spanish at home and they listen to things in Spanish. That doesn't mean that they don't listen or read English. They just mean that they understand and speak Spanish at home. So we have about a 40 million uh, population that actually consumes and potentially can consume news in Spanish. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. This is just basically some background to see how difficult this, this, this is. So when we actually look at where we are right now, well, this OER is clearly under construction. And it is under construction because thank you very much, COVID-19. We really appreciate it. Uh, I had plans to travel all over the place, go to Miami headquarters everywhere, and here we are again. So the textbook is in Spanish, it's still under construction, and it's gonna continue to be developed, of course. So when you think about television, television in the United States, it's important for you to understand that we have two populations, if you wanna call it mainstream, and those who are the Hispanic population that will consume news in Spanish. So let's go to the next slide, and we're gonna separate those populations. These are called designated market areas. So the first one that you see there is the designated market area uh, that is Hispanic. So the number one market in Spanish language is going to be LA, Los Angeles. Then we're gonna have New York. Now, if you go to the DMA total, meaning the mainstream, we see that New York is number one and LA is gonna be number two. So they kind of flip, see, they kind of flip. And then you have the TVHH, that means television households, households who actually have a TV. And they give you the number of TV households that you have on each one of those markets. So what the thing that makes, for example, Texas special is that Texas has four out of the top 10 markets. So we have Houston, we have Dallas, we have San Antonio, and we have, um, we have Harlingen, uh, McAllen, Wislaco area. So it's kind of a good place to create an OER focusing on Spanish language television news. So we have these two things happening at the same time. And that's why you have to think, again, going back to the corn, that you have all of these elements distributed and you have different markets happening at the same time. Let's go to the next slide. And when we have all these things happening at, this, at, the, at the same time, you have to remember that language changes. I mean, you start losing Spanish language with generations. So if you're foreign born, you're more likely to get news from Univision and Telemundo. But if you are second and third generation, you start to migrate towards English language or 
bilingual journalism. So there is a lot of potential on bilingual journalism because there are demographic changes taking place in the United States, not only in the terms of Hispanic population growth, but in terms of language change. The Hispanic population continues to grow in the United States, but it's not growing because they're crossing the border and invading the nation, you know, as it is said on so many, you know, tweets and things and disinformation campaigns. The, the Hispanic population is growing because Latinos are having children in the United States. So we're seeing an increase in second generation and we're seeing an increase in third generation. And because of that, what we see is that there is an emerging bilingual journalism opportunity in the United States. One company that has made of this their flagship is NBC Universal Telemundo. And that's because they have what is known as own and operated stations. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> this is the map of the United States where NBC and Telemundo own and operate stations in the same market. So I am located in Dallas Fort Worth. That means that in Dallas Fort Worth, we have NBC5 and we have Telemundo. And if you actually look at their newsroom, there's, their newsroom is shared half by NBC and half by Telemundo and they are in the same roof. What that means is that if you have a bilingual journalist working for Telemundo, that bilingual journalist can become also a resource for NBC. This is especially critical when you're covering, for example, hurricanes in Florida. So if you have Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and they have NBC and Telemundo under the same roof, and there is a, tor a, a tornado, a hurricane, we have tornadoes here in Texas, so that's why. If you have a hurricane moving uh, to Florida, then NBC Telemundo can expand their coverage because they have a larger bilingual journalism population in their newsrooms. So that is kind of something that is moving. They're, they're conscious about this demographic changes and language use in the United States. It's slowly gonna be moving in that direction and they're preparing and working together to be able to develop content that targets Latinos who don't necessarily speak Spanish or who consume content in English and Spanish. Let's go to the next slide. So when I started working on this OER, it's written in Spanish. And one thing is that you have to really look at the corn and see how you can diversify enough that OER so that we can be reflective of who Latinos are. Latinos are not monolithic. Latinos are multicultural, multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-everything. So, uh, and they're, they adopt technologies much faster than anyone else. And as a matter of fact, I did a research in 2011 that showed that undocumented immigrants or un unauthorized immigrants have a higher smartphone and technology penetration than citizens of the United States born in the USA. And that's because they have to stay connected um, with their families and their friends in their countries of origin. So this is, we come from familistic cultures and familistic cultures for us, staying in contact with family is important. And when family becomes, you know, the, the driving force, then we adopt technology really fast in better ways, far more aggressively to stay in contact and we stay ahead of everyone else. Is that good? Absolutely. Is that an opportunity? Yes, please. So when, we, when I look at this OER, I'm trying to look at the OER from the point of view of, I need to treat Latinos the way they are. They are high tech, they're highly informed. And because of that, I'm pushing the idea of creating videos of how they're automating TV stations to produce newscasts. So we're basically spearheading uh, productions focusing on, on, on uh, newscast automation is called Ross Overdrive. I need to show them and educate them about the system, the kind of salaries that they can get, how they can move through the system, 
Because remember, we might come from, from, from our origins might come from Mexico or Colombia, Venezuela or Ecuador, and we have to apply what we know and adjust to the American system. So explaining the American system to Latinos is important for them to be able to then understand how it works and then move forward and create upward mobility, not only in their career, but social mobility too. Examples of how to create the reels, examples on, on how to create a resume. Uh, we have advice from media professionals who've been in the industry for decades. Um, we give them advice on how to edit sound bites or interviews. So whenever you have an interview in English, then we have to translate it into Spanish and then three different types of editing, whether you want to do it as a hammock, whether you want to do it as a recostado or leaning. And then you have to do, you know, all together, um, literal translation or paraphrasing. So there are a lot of complexities into this, but once you start going through the OER and once, once we continue to develop this, it's going to be fascinating. Latinos are incredibly technically savvy. And because of that, I can do whatever I want in this OER. It can be as multimedia as I want and they will not lose a beat. So let's go to the next slide. And the question that comes to mind is, this is an innovation grant. So where are we right now? Can I hop in for a second? We are yes. running a little over time. We have nine minutes left. And yes, we... I'm about to end. Okay. So where, where are we right now when it comes to Spanish language textbooks, Spanish language television news production in the United States, OERs, textbooks, and all of this? And the answer is the next slide. We are right here. So we are just getting started. We're nowhere near. And this is the reason why we need these efforts by you know, organizations like the UTA Library. So we need to work harder at understanding culture and translating that culture into television news. Thank you, that's it. Okay, thanks everyone. So I, I had a couple of comments about um, capacity and inclusion. I will keep this really brief because I want to stop sharing my screen and take a look at the chat. Um, let's see if we have any questions there. Um, but just very quickly, we are really focused on building capacity by um, helping to educate people, to train them to be able to do more of this work themselves. Um, and we find that things tend to spread through word of mouth, as you know, Bonnie shared, going back to her department, bringing more people on board. Um, so that can really help us uh, grow our capacity um, and also be more inclusive. So, and, and a lot is, when we talk about inclusivity, um, we are a very diverse campus, and so we do have some benefits in that way. Um, but our student government president, Blaise LeFleur, presented over the summer a really powerful message about how our campus in particular um, cannot hide behind a banner of diversity. And so some of the next steps that we have as a grant program is to take a look at our numbers and see who we are awarding grants to. Um, we did a, a very quick assessment of this and found that about half of our grantees are, are white. Um, and so what does that mean for a campus as diverse as ours? Uh, about half of our grantees are non-tenure track. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, so taking a, a better look at those numbers and comparing them to um, what our diversity numbers look like for the educators on our campus. So, so those are next steps and I will just leave it there and stop sharing so I can take a look at chat. Um, did anyone have any questions? We have said it all. We've said it all, Michelle. They're, they're just blowing away. <laughs> Actually, you're right. <laughs> Both were really brilliant. Thank you. Uh, so I we did a, a presentation, um, I and some colleagues in the library did a presentation last week uh, for Open Education Conference. And Julian was one of the, we talked to some of our creators, Julian was one of the people that we interviewed. So I will try to dig up that link 
uh, and share it in chat if you want to hear more from him um, about the program and kind of the reception uh, among his colleagues and with the department and all of the, um, uh, the partners he talked about. So I will make sure you can get to that. Michelle, there is one question for you in the chat from Alexis. It says, after your period of evaluation, do you anticipate any changes in the awarding program? Yeah, so we are already talking about changes we want to make. We've had um, some rebranding ideas in mind uh, for a while. Um, want to do more, so like Bonnie's uh, uh, project, for example, wasn't a true adoption project. There was some modification involved. So we've been thinking about ways to accommodate projects like that, um, not forcing them into, you know, the innovation grant or into the adoption stipends, but really trying to accommodate the, the diversity of projects um, that come to us. So we're also looking at um, Ohio State University has an, a new grant program they launched over the summer that's connected to racial justice. And so we're looking at things that we can do to pull those kinds of awards into our program. And um, we're going to immediately, we're planning to launch our application for innovation grants. The adoption stipends are open on a rolling basis. Um, but starting next year, we, we plan to, you know, take a look at how we're uh, organizing the grant program and trying to grow it out so we have a number of um, additional categories and really prioritizing some of our, our values connected to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, but one piece that we didn't talk a lot about that I think is really important is our approach to accessibility. So we provide training, um, really trying to teach people to think about and be proactive about accessibility when they're creating their OER. Um, so we do training, we do preliminary evaluations, and then uh, evaluating the text before it's published. Um, and then try to help do any kind of remediation necessary. So, so that's been really important um, for inclusion, just to make sure that we're, we're thinking about all our students um, and all of the different needs out there and, and not um, unintentionally, very is usually the case, but unintentionally um, excluding people on the basis of their uh, abilities. Great, thank you. So folks, we have about three more minutes for questions. If anybody wanted to, um, if anybody has any more questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat or even just hop on the mic to ask our panelists. I should say, Julian, it's just so brilliant to look at um, uh, TV journalism. Um, as, as a lens into multiculturalism, and it's like so new to me. Um, and, and I guess I just, I mean, it, it's a longer question, but just like, um, how well does it really capture all that, um, all those ears of corn? Because um, I'm sure that they have to make decisions on to how, um, I don't even know how news operations run, I'm very ignorant, but just um, like there's, there's a lot of decisions that they have to make about who their audience is. Yes, and, and I think, what happens is that every designated market area, every TV market needs to make locally those decisions. So one thing that happened is that um, NHJ, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, almost 20 years ago, came out with a, a, a style book for language use. And I personally think that it was terrible. And the reason why, and it has not been updated, uh, it's been kind of an abandoned part. And the reason why I think it was terrible is because, because it, pretty much anything, um, anything you say has a, has a different interpretation depending on where you come from. And, and because of that, I think that more than focusing on how you should say things, we should instead focus on how you should handle things so that you have room for local adjustment. How to translate things, uh, how to edit video and do translations, how to paraphrase, how to do it literally, how to focus on facts, 
how to focus on acronyms, things that are important because translating an acronym might not mean much to us if we don't understand fully the American system. So it's more important about focus on the things that are key, but then make language decisions based on the composition of your audience. And that thing that builds enough flexibility for everyone to fit the corn where it needs to go. Um, can I just add to that? Um, I, I had a really interesting interview that I did yesterday with uh, a, a woman who um, uh, has a few different disabilities. And as, as a storyteller myself, that's been an area where I've been wanting to start doing more of my storytelling, but I've been really afraid of, of the language. And it's because, you know, what one person, um, what one person with the same disability is okay with, another person is not. And, and sometimes they can be very at odds, um, even, um, even though it's the same disability. And uh, one of the things that sort of, that I've, I've been learning as I've been kind of studying ableism and, uh, and, and also like, you know, when I spoke with this author uh, yesterday, who's been writing books um, that have disabled characters in them, um, one of the things she said, and, and that I keep hearing echoed over and over again, part of it's about asking the person who you're, you're referring to what their preferred language is. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, my cat. <laughs> 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 that me talking to people on, on the computer means that she should be part of a circus performance in the background here. Thank so, you. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say thank you, Erica, for that for that point. Um, that's that's actually a point I was having a conversation with my sister about the other day. My sister is a teacher and she, she raised the same point. And I think um, that's a really important way to end this session. I hate to end it here because it is such an important topic, but I just dropped the link in the chat um, right now for the connect page for this session. And I encourage all of you to continue the conversation there. Um, leave your questions, leave your comments, and